I'm getting sidetracked on a joke I wanted to make on the previous one, and it's getting stuck in my head now. Just say it. Going, it, just I was, say it. Get it out. I was going to ask James, are are we going to have to disclose that one of the authors on this sauropod tail paper is our biological mother, Emmanuel Chap? Alrighty, welcome everybody to the Fossil Friday Review. We are the Skeleton Crew. My name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral research scholar at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. I'm Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. I'm Alex Rubenstahl. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University. And I'm Dalton Meyer, also a PhD candidate at Yale University. Alrighty, so today we've got four papers to talk about, um, about a variety of topics. We've got the evolution of structures in dinosaurs related to air sacs, growth in early amphibians, ice age ecosystems, and the first one that we'll be talking about, which is tail whips in long neck dinosaurs. As we all know, when a problem comes along, you must whip it, but must you? <laughs> What this paper presupposes is that perhaps you mustn't. This paper is called Multibody Analysis and Soft Tissue Strength Refute Supersonic Dinosaur Tail. Um, but you can, you can kind of condense that mouthful into uh, sauropod dinosaurs did not whip it. Um, and so to talk about this paper, you kind of have to have a little bit of background. Um, first of all, what's it about? It's about sauropod dinosaurs. So sauropod dinosaurs, if you're not aware, are the kind of prototypical long-necked, four-legged plant-eating dinosaurs. Uh, there's variations on that scheme that occur within the group, but by and large, they can be characterized as having long necks and eating plants um, and standing on four legs. And this paper is about a particular group of sauropods that's called diplodocoids. So as that name might imply, you get things like diplodocus in there. Uh, you also get things like Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, as well as some other more weird members of the group. But one thing that characterizes most members of this group is that compared even to other sauropods, in addition to having a long neck, they also have an extremely long tail. There's been speculation over what function they may have had, and that's ranged from, you know, being a kind of defensive mechanism, I think you could slap away a predator with this big tail. Um, perhaps they've been proposed to have a tactile function so that you know, if they have a very long tail, you can kind of tap along things behind you and get a sense of, of your environment. Um, and one particularly notable proposal is that they served a function of making a whip crack sound because superficially the tail is actually very similar to a bull whip in that they both have a thick base and they taper towards the end and they're both very long. And, and notably, not only is the tail long and thin in these animals, the actual vertebrae that make up the tail, the individual backbone elements, um, they're very thick and, and fairly normal at the base of the tail. But as you get towards the tip of the tail, they actually become um, very simplified and just kind of small little cylinders. And so it's not just that these things had thin tails that people are, uh, are curious about what they're doing, but it's because this anatomy seems to be unique and it may be facilitating uh, a kind of a whip crack action. And it's, it's interesting that because of this kind of whip tail hypothesis, the subgroup that all these uh, diplodocids are in is actually named flagelli caudata, which is a mouthful of Latin, meaning flagelli, which is whip. If you think of like a flagellate, you know, whipping themselves, um, flagelli is whip and caudata is tail. So flagelli caudata is whip tail. So this idea has permeated so far into kind of our understanding of the group that uh, we actually named the group the whiptails. But so, so the idea that these, these tails are at least superficially whip-like is, is certainly has a lot of grounding in the field um, and has been talked about a lot. And if we think that they're superficially like a whip, then they may have functioned similar to a whip. And so whips famously crack, if you've seen an Indiana Jones movie, you know the, the sound. And that the sound of a whip crack is actually a sonic boom. So the movement of a whip, uh, creates a wave that goes across the length of the whip. And at the end, when the end of the whip kind of flicks, it's actually moving so fast that it breaks the sound barrier, um, which for reference is 340 meters per second or 760 miles per hour. So the tip is moving extremely, extremely fast. And it, it creates a sonic boom that we hear is a whip crack. 
And so the question is, could these whip-like tails and these dinosaurs move at the speed of sound and create a whip crack? And this is actually, there's been some back and forth in the literature um, within kind of the past, within recent memory, at least, it's been kind of accepted that they probably could create a whip crack sound. That was kind of the last word on it. But the first investigation into this actually uh, said, no, they can't move their tail that fast and it wouldn't make a whip crack sound. That was based on just a model of all of the bones and, and simulating what would happen if you kind of coiled it up and then uncoiled it very quickly. Um, and then more recent work that said, actually, yes, they probably could uh, move their tails fast enough to break the sound barrier uh, was based on simplifying the model instead of trying to look at each individual backbone element, um, kind of breaking it into chunks and how would those chunks move relative to one another. And that analysis, which also included building a physical model that I've heard is very impressive and I'd love to see one day. Um, but that analysis found that they could break the sound barrier and make a whip-like sound, oh, a whip crack-like sound. Um, it's also interesting to note, and I was unaware of this, but that that analysis proposed some conjecture of a hypothetical soft tissue popper at the end of the tail. So at the end of a bull whip, there's like this little fringe of fabric that's called a popper. And that is what actually flaps and, and produces the sonic boom. And it gets really frayed and it's called the popper because it makes the pop sound. Uh, and this paper proposed that at the tip of the tail of these dinosaurs, there could have been some hypothetical soft tissue structure that would have served as a popper. Uh, nothing like that's preserved in the fossil record, but you know, it's not outside of the realm of possibility. I've actually seen that in a couple paleo art depictions, like nothing that's exactly one-to-one -one like you see at the end of a bullwhip, but I've definitely seen uh, soft, speculative soft tissue structures at the end of a uh, diplodocid tail that kind of, because, well, we know diplodocids had those kind of spikes going down their backs, like iguana-like to at least some degree, like we see mm -hmm. in Walking with Dinosaurs. I've seen some people extend those a bit right at oh. the end of the tail, uh, just in some reconstructions. And I guess that might be what this is based off of. So that's neat. Yeah. What if what kind of tissue would it have to be that it could like if it were used in that way that it could withstand that happening over and over and over? Yeah, that's a an excellent question. Because it's not it, hair. No, <laughs> um, and they they address that a bit in this paper. Um, uh, but there's like a number of tissues it could be like the kind of ideas that is some kind of keratinized structure, um, yeah. or, or it could be maybe a filament, um, but bristles maybe um, yeah it's very gross to think about um but it's important to know that like none of the exact like none of the very tips of the tails of any of these animals have ever been found mm -hmm. um and and certainly and that's just the bones and certainly no soft tissue impressions so it's it is an idea and if it's an idea that's compatible with the whip crack model because you probably would want something at the tip of the tail to kind of perform that popper function um, if in fact that was going on. Um, but it's something I just didn't know about before. I kind of assumed that the whole thing was predicated on just the tail alone, but this, this popper is also a factor. Um, but that kind of summarizes the work that's been done to this point on diplodocid whip tails. Uh, and this new paper, which it, I didn't mention before, but it's by Simone Conti and, uh, and colleagues. It uses new modeling methods to assess whether this whip tail function is compatible with the anatomy of these animals. Um, and it does that in a couple of ways. So like the first one is just using new computer techniques with a, a, a new model of the vertebral column to assess this function. Importantly to that end, they do something in this paper that wasn't done before, which is they add the sacrum. So the sacrum are all of the vertebrae that are kind of part of the pelvis. And so they, they are right before the tail starts. Um, and they found that actually putting that kind of immobile block of backbones, because, because they're bound by the, the hip bones on either side, they don't really move very much. Um, by putting that kind of immobile block at the base of the tail, the very base has less mobility than was previously modeled. And that pretty dramatically impacts kind of the speed at which the tail can move and propagate a wave down its length. Um, and so that's a big impact. 
And the other kind of new thing that this study does that hasn't been looked into before is it actually looks into the soft tissues that would have surrounded the tail and the strength of those soft tissues. So I hate to say this because it sounds like, you know, anyone who's like, oh, I thought about this before it was cool. And like, it's never something I would have thought to pursue in research because I don't work on sauropods. But I had, when people talked about the whip tail, generally had the thought like, yeah, I, I can believe that, but I am curious about what that would do to soft tissue. Like what does skin and muscle do when it's movement, it's breaking the sound barrier. And uh, this study kind of looks into that. It looks into what effect would the soft tissue have on a whip crack ability and, and the strength of the soft tissue. Um, and so importantly, they described that there would have been kind of three soft tissues that would have been surrounding the tip of the tail. Like at the very far tip of it, there's not really muscle anymore. Um, but on the outside, you would have skin, and then there'd be ligaments, and there'd be tendons. And kind of in that order, they are stronger than one another. So skin is the weakest, ligaments are stronger than skin, and tendons are stronger than ligaments. And that's related to how much collagen they have in them, and how, how that collagen is arranged in those structures. Uh, but they, they looked at the different kind of physical properties of all of those things. And they did analyses that you would do in kind of a, a mechanical engineering uh, framework to, to assess, would these tissues be strong enough to withstand these stresses? And then also how does the, um, the presence of these tissues impact the ability of the tail to move? And what they find, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should also mention, they, they also did analyses like without a hypothetical popper and they also tested several hypothetical poppers uh, made of different materials, uh, biological materials, I should say. So they tested some that were more keratinous, some that were more ligamentous uh, and then tendinous uh, poppers. Um, but what the ultimate takeaway of this paper is, is that it looks like these animals probably couldn't break the sound barrier with their tail. Um, this is incorporating things like the limited mobility at the base, the amount of muscle mass there is, the influence of air drag on the tail itself. And taking all that into account, they find that uh, rather than being able to go the 340 meters per second that you need to break the sound barrier, they're only able to go 32, like almost 33 meters per second, which still comes out to about 75 miles an hour. So these tails are moving very fast, but not the extreme amount of speed that you need to break the sound barrier and make a sonic boom. It's actually about 10 times slower than uh, you would need to make a sonic boom. And they also found that the soft tissue at that speed, at a sonic boom type speed, wouldn't be strong enough uh, if it was realistically thin. So in order to, to make the soft tissue strong enough to withstand the forces of a sonic boom, of a whip crack tail, it has to be so thick that A, it just seems biologically unrealistic, but B, that thickness then adds weight to the tail, which means that it needs more force to move fast enough to break the sound barrier. And so you kind of have this runaway effect of like, oh, I got to make it thicker, then I got to move it faster, then I got to make it thicker. And it just doesn't quite work out. Um, and they found that adding the hypothetical tail poppers didn't help to create a whip-like effect. And in fact, they just added drag and uh, and made it worse as a, as a whip crack. So it, it seems like the the kind of idea of, of bullwhip tails in these dinosaurs can probably be laid to rest. I don't think based off of this data that it's uh, particularly supported, uh, but it's important to note that at the end of the paper, they do say that you know defense, a defensive function for these tails is still certainly viable. Like even if they weren't making whip crack thunder booms to, to scare away predators, like a humongous <laughs> tail that's like 30 feet long and weighs God knows how much moving at 75 miles an hour, if it hits you, it's going to hurt very badly. So yeah, it's still a very effective defensive tool. Um, and perhaps there's other reasons why the tails were, were so elongate and elaborated at the tip and had the kind of unique anatomy. That's something that's going to have to have more research done to it. Um, you know, people are going to have to propose new ideas and then those ideas are going to have to be tested like they did here. But I think this is a really nice example of taking an idea of a function of a fossil organism, or at least a part of a fossil organism, and actually testing it with modern techniques, uh, updating kind of our assumptions about what needs to happen, and, and taking into account things that we 
either hadn't been able to in the past or just hadn't gotten around to in the past. And it's not, of course, to disparage past research. People do the best with what they can. This is just taking it the next step, iterating positively as science, you know, needs to do. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a very, it's a really cool paper about some really cool dinosaurs. So to clarify, basically, they're just saying that they didn't make, they, they didn't break the speed of sound, but they definitely could have been used as a whip. Yes, I guess a whip yeah. in the sense of like, I'm uh, gonna a whip weapon. at you. A yeah. weapon, yeah. Mm -hmm. but not, not, not breaking the speed of sound, but yeah. to use as a weapon in, in a whip-like fashion. So, so these animals could, to some degree, whip it. They could whip it. But they couldn't but they whip could... it good. Okay, Scott. Do you want to take this rare opportunity to tell us about research you contributed to? Yeah, absolutely. So this paper specifically was looking at when fast growth evolved in tetrapods. So what are tetrapods? Tetrapods, uh, it's kind of in the name. It means four foot, so it's four legged animals, but also some that lost their legs later on. So essentially, they can be broken down into two groups. The amniotes, which are include things like us and reptiles, so mammals and reptiles, and what I had always called amphibians, but I found out the proper term is anamniotes in reading this paper, and I very much dislike this term. So I'm just going to call them amphibians. Uh, so it's amphibians and the mammals and reptiles, the amniotes. And one of the characteristics that has always been thought to distinguish, especially the more derived amniotes, the air quotes, more advanced ones, especially the warm blooded ones, is their rate of growth. And we can we can see this in their metabolic rate and in the rate that they attain skeletal maturity and reproductive maturity. So it has always been seen that growth rate is a little bit of a trade-off, that if you're growing at a slower rate, that means that you require less energy to make it to your skeletal maturity, to make it so you're fully grown. but it takes you a much longer time to reach your maximum size. Inversely, if you are a fast growing animal, you can most likely get to that full grown size a whole lot faster. You need to eat a lot. Think about how there are some crocodiles in Africa that they'll essentially only have like one or two meals a year during big migrations and stuff. and us being fast growing animals, we need three, mail, three meals a day. So it, it's historically been thought that this is a kind of trait that we only really see in the warm blooded animals, but more recent studies has shown that this might be a trait that evolves earlier on in amniotes, uh, because we see it in some of the earlier relatives of reptiles and mammals, including things like uh, pelicosaurs, which include things like Dimetrodon, and not just in birds, but we see this in dinosaurs and in pterosaurs as well. So if we draw a line between those two groups, we essentially just get amniotes. So there's a chance that the groups in amniotes that have these slower growing uh, metabolisms evolved that independently of each other. But what this paper is specifically looking at is a is did this fast growing system evolve before amniotes in amphibians? And to do that, they uh, so you might you might ask yourself, how do you tell what the growth rate is of animals that have been dead for? well, in this specific case, th like 330 million years. So you do a technique that's called histology. And histology is a type of what we call destructive sampling, or as the head author of this paper, Meg Whitney, uh, euphemistically like to refer to it as uh, data acquisition. Uh, that you basically cut a piece out of a bone, in this case, specifically a bone, and get it as th 
thin as possible using grinders and other devices so, uh, so light can be shine shown so you can see light through it. And you put that under a microscope and you are looking specifically at the microscopic structure of those bones. And now it, it, this is something that I always need to remind myself of that bones are very, very much living tissue. It's how we grow throughout our lives. But even when we like stop growing and get to our full size, your bones are still growing and changing and they're still very much alive. They're constantly remodeling and fixing breaks and just growing and changing throughout your entire life. Specifically what these researchers were looking for was the presence or absence of fibrolamellar bone, which big crazy Latin word, it essentially means haphazardly arranged fibers within the bone that are a characteristic structure of fast growth rates. We see these in those previously mentioned fast growing animals like birds, mammals, dinosaurs, stuff like that. So in order to estimate this growth rate, and it's all well and good if you see the presence or absence of this bone, but to get a good sense of the growth rate of an animal, you need a good growth series. Hence where this horrifying salamander crocodile monstrosity comes in. Uh, this animal is called Wachiria, and it is named uh, after the, the hometown of the discoverer, uh, Phil McAdams, which I am not kidding you, is called What Cheer Iowa. Like two separate words, what cheer? So they just what? push them together, and it's what cheeria? What cheer for Iowa? I've what never. cheer? Yeah. So that's the hometown of 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 Pat McAdams, the discoverer of Wacheria, and so it's named after that. Did they find it there? Uh, no. It's found in it's found in Delta County, Iowa. Uh, hence it's. Uh, species name, which is Delta. So, huh. yeah. But uh, this awful monstrosity of an animal that I love very much, honestly, is uh, was the dominant predator in its ecosystem. And we have a lot of fossils of it. There's something like 400 specimens of this animal. And they represent essentially every life stage. We have some that are very small up to relatively substantially sized that uh, this animal could, when it was fully grown, get up to like seven feet long. It was hands down the largest carnivore that we know of in this ecosystem. And so this research team sampled uh, seven femora, which is the plural for feet. Uh, uh, wait, this research team sampled nine femora, which is the plural for femur, uh, in this study. and. Uh, specifically did what I said before, the histology sa uh, samples, where they cut out a little puck, grind it down so it's thin enough for light to shine through, and then look at the structure on there. So if you look on figure two here, you can see some of the specific histology slides. And the ones that you see in bright pink there are under polarized light. And the ones in black and light, black and white are under a lambda filter. Uh, these highlight different aspects of the structure of the bone. And I guess while we are actually looking at these slides, uh, I'll mention that I helped make some of these. This is actually my first foray into histology. Uh, I would argue that much more of what I did on these were prep, prep related. Uh, one of the uh, femora had a lot of sediment on the back of it that I had to prep off. And one of them also really, really, really wanted to fall apart a lot. So I had to stabilize that one quite a bit so we could actually have it strong enough where it could be cut on the saw and not just disintegrate and be gone, reduced to atoms. So if you're looking at the pink histology sections on the top there, the ones that are su uh, size class one, you might be able to see a little bit of a darker pink 
kind of halo around specifically the left side and top. It's a little hard to see if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, and it's better illustrated on uh, figure five with the line drawings, where those are those specific features of the bone are highlighted a little bit better or a little bit more obviously. And what was found in Wacheria is that this fibrolamellar bone um, is present in the smallest individuals of this growth series of Wacheria, but not present in the larger ones, which indicates that the juveniles were growing very, very quickly and were reaching that larger body size quicker than other predators in their ecosystem. Uh, specifically, this paper compares Wacheria to uh, a contemporary carnivorous uh, amphibian, Greerurbaton. And you can see Greerurbaton right below that one. And it has way more of that uh, lamellar bone, which is a uh, bone that is uh, that has its fibers arranged in uh, parallel lines. And that is indicating of slightly slower growth. So this is enforcing that uh, which area was probably reaching that maximum growth size a whole lot faster than a lot of its competition and allowing it to be the apex predator of its ecosystem. And this also marks one of the funniest times I've seen an animal be drawn comparison to T-Rex because this thing's a little salamander croc monster and like half the popular papers I've seen are saying it's it's basically like T-Rex, which I find funny. And I think oh, it's because it's not so similar to T-Rex. Yeah, I mean, got teeth, bite things, same thing, same, same, but different. Uh, what Shiria, what clade is it in? Or I guess what, what group is it in? Because I'm not allowed to say clade. Uh, you're going to hate this. It's a Wacherid. OK. <laughs> Be a little less stupid. Uh, it's it's just an early tetrapod. OK, so. Stegocephalian. Yeah, yeah. So is this something that metamorphosed? I don't know. I think that's I I, I don't think these were metamorphic. Right? I, I do not believe so. I think that that's like where does that disappear on our. I think metamorphosing. I, that might happen in list amphibians. But temnospondyls do it. This well, one's not a temnospondyl. Right, but what I'm saying, right, like, is that an ancestral condition to like tetrapods, or is that just? I think that's unknown. But what does this like? What do Sicilians do? Like they just look like okay. little little Sicilians. Like they have gills. Some of them do. The aquatic ones do. Like they have gills that they they shed later or something. But there's no. They don't. They don't have tadpoles. I don't believe. Yeah. They join the mafia. <laughs> That's, what That's how mafia works. works. So the paper I'm discussing is entitled "A Two Million Year Old Ecosystem in Greenland and Covered by Environmental DNA," and I think that it's worth talking about first what environmental DNA is. So a lot of people are familiar with DNA as the so-called building block of life, right? Uh, DNA is just a molecule that we use to pass down information. DNA codes for proteins. So the protein code is transcribed when we grow and develop and do all sorts of things that we do as animals. And the proteins are used to either control the way our bones grow or execute basic functions in our cells like metabolism. Uh, and, and signaling pathways, things like that. So we know that animals have DNA in their cells. We're pretty familiar with it, I think, at this point from movies like Jurassic Park that focus on the role that DNA plays in you know, being the fundamental building block of an organism. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that we leave our DNA everywhere in the environment that we live in, right? And if that doesn't make sense, you can think about forensic crime scenes, right? You will have DNA in the form of your skin cells. Forensic methods that we use now don't really pick up that sort of DNA, um, usually, unless it's trapped under the fingernails of somebody you harmed or something like that. But we leave our DNA in every environment that we uh, pass through. 
You might not be able to detect it on an individual level, but you can tell what species are present by sampling the DNA that's just present ambiently in the environment. This is used a lot now in conservation biology, in that if you want to know what species are present in the waterway, you can just take a water sample and look for DNA codes that match different species that are known in the area. Right, so we can do this specifically. I know this has been done a lot to track the spread of invasive carp species in the United States. Right, you can check riverways and uh, different ponds and lakes to see if there are carp present in there just by seeing if carp DNA are present in the environment. So the fundamental point of this paper is that we're using the preserved DNA in sediments in Greenland to look at the environmental DNA not of the modern day, but of the past. So what we find is something really interesting. The entire composition of this ecosystem in Greenland two million years ago is different than anything we see on Earth today. We see a combination of species that prefer warmer environments like horseshoe crabs and corals in association with animals that we typically associate with frozen tundra today, right? Like reindeer and uh, mastodon and mammoths that would have only lived in very cold climates. And so... I don't have a tremendous amount to say about this paper. Environmental DNA is certainly not my area of research, but I think it's important that it drives home this conclusion that I think is really important to keep in mind when we do our work. And that is that the environments of the past don't necessarily have modern analogs, right? We always want to try to force different paleo environments to fit into some model of the present day. We often say that the ecosystem in Western North America at the end of the Cretaceous was like similar to the Everglades or Louisiana Bayou. But there are many ways in which environments, even in the recent geologic past, this is only two million years ago, would have been fundamentally different than anything we can observe on Earth today. And so I think that this paper is making a very interesting point about what ecosystems looked like at the end of the Ice Age. And I think it raises some questions about why we have no modern analogs for this ecosystem today. Right? It's possible that this is only something that could exist in prior geologic conditions, which means that we're not seeing the full range of possible ecosystems on our planet now, that the arrangement of the continents and the ocean currents, atmospheric cycles, are creating ecosystems that are not really the full range of what's possible on Earth. It's also possible that human effects on the environment are to blame for the loss of this sort of ecosystem. Although I think the, the general absence of these sorts of ecosystems from even historical records would argue that it's probably a geological signal. And I think the fundamental takeaway is just that we need to keep in mind that the environment of the past may have been very unfamiliar to us, even if we're only going quite recently into the geologic past. That if you were a time traveler or if you're a paleontologist trying to study an extinct ecosystem, you need to approach it almost as if it's an alien planet or a different historical era in which we can't really contextualize everything in a pure modern analog there will be things that we don't really have a current model that we can use to understand them. Or if we're using a current model to understand them, it's going to be incomplete and imperfect in some way. Questions, comments, concerns? So essentially, what kind of implications does this have of essentially doing kind of what we've been doing for as long as we've been looking at the past of using modern ecosystems as analogs for prehistoric environments. So I think that what you need to do always with that sort of work, and this I think extends very far in every realm of paleontology, right? Not just for ecosystem reconstruction, but even for anatomical observations. You can use modern things as a guideline. You can use modern ecosystems as a guideline to understand past ones. You can use modern animals as a guideline to try to reconstruct the behaviors and lifestyles of extinct ones. But at some point, we have to contend with the fact that we don't have the full spectrum preserved today. And there might be entire solutions to mechanical problems or entire types of ecosystems that we can't really observe directly and we can only reconstruct by analogy or by extension from what we already know. Right? It's not like I'm talking about an ecosystem here where all the life forms are based on silicon instead of carbon and it's fundamentally different. What we're talking about is this northern ecosystem with tundra-like and boreal forest-like characters that also has warm water currents that are bringing in uh, marine species that tend to live much further south today. And so it's an ecosystem composition that we just don't see now. But it's not something that we can't really understand. And so I think the key is that we can use our modern world today is a guideline for our expectations, 
but we can't try to force extinct animals or ecosystems to fit into those models, right? This kind of gets back to the uh, question of Spinosaurus and its lifestyle that we talked about a couple of episodes ago, right? Oh no, it's coming back. Spinosaurus always comes back. It's like no. herpes. Crap. Jesus. <laughs> I think that the interesting thing with Spinosaurus is that if it is really a swimming animal in some way, and this is not to get back into the question of whether it was a swimmer, I think that the paper that just came out that we discussed in our first episode, Link, will presumably be on screen now if I remember how to do that and remember to do it. Yeah, Link Link in the vague direction that Scott's pointing in. And you can see he's hedging his bets so that in case it appears anywhere, he will have pointed at it. Um... The key thing is that if Spinosaurus was really a water-dwelling animal, it might be presenting a suite of adaptations and traits that are <laughs> unknown in any modern swimming animal. Right. I think we need to think about this as a possibility for a lot of extinct animals, especially ones with no easy modern analogs. Extinct ecosystems are extinct. They're not always going to map one-to-one onto things we see today, both the, the ecosystems and the animals living in them. All right, now we've, you know, we talked about whip tails and some DNA in the cold place and growing frog things. So let's talk about let's let's, let's take it let's take it back to dinosaurs to wrap it all up. So the last paper uh, we're going to be chatting about today is about pneumaticity in dinosaurs. So, right, like, what what is what does that mean? So before we get into the paper, I'm going to do a little, we're going to do just kind of a, a little quick review of, of, of what pneumaticity is and kind of how it relates to dinosaur breathing in, in particular. So when dinosaurs were first discovered, uh, some paleontologists noticed that in their vertebra, they tended to have uh, some of them, sauropods, so your long-necked dinosaurs and meat-eating theropods and their descendants bird, descended birds have these big holes carved into their, uh, into their vertebra that we call pleuroseals. Now, these holes, for a long time, we weren't sure what they were for. It was suggested they were adaptations because dinosaurs got so big, they kept the bones relatively light. Um, but eventually it was recognized that these features uh, seem to be similar to features seen in living birds, in which their vertebra have these great big holes carved into their sides and their uh, neural arches, so those are the more complex parts of the top of the vertebra. And it was proposed that these holes were receiving the same kind of tissue. So in birds, birds have lungs like us, but where birds differ from us is that instead of doing what we call tidal respiration, so in human beings and mammals and some crocs and turtles, they have a diaphragm, a muscle that pulls the lung cavity down and air flows in and that's how you breathe. And it relaxes, exhale. Birds have a series of complex sacs attached to their lung, and we call these air sacs. These air sacs then send extra tissue all over the skeleton. These are called, uh, we, we call these the diverticuli of the air sacs. Now it's important to keep in mind that these are separate fr structures from the air sacs. The air sacs are sacs and they sit in the body, in the, in the thoracic cavity. Even if it's something called a cervical air sac, so the cervical air sac is still in the body, but it sends elements of its tissue, this, this what we call diverticuli, out into the skeleton. And it's, it's, an aggressive, it's an aggressive tissue, and it carves into all the bone. Why it does this? We're not totally sure. This, it could be non-adaptive in that this is just, it's, a, it's an invasive tissue that just kind of does what it does. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Anyway. So it was noticed that dinosaurs had these, these spaces carved into their bones. And it was proposed that perhaps these were for a similar air sac system. And as the connection between birds and dinosaurs became uh, more apparent in the 60s, up through the 90s, this idea was slowly accepted. There are a lot of patterns in the skeleton and, so, and things like this that further went on to support this diagnosis of, of a of these structures for the attachment of air of, of air sacs into the bone, and so now today we gen we there is a consensus that dinosaurs have this complex bird-like respiratory system. 
Um, these air sacs, functionally, what they allow them to do is something called unidirectional airflow, in which air flows into the lung, but also into one of these sacs. When they inhale and when they exhale, stale air goes out of the lung and fresh air goes into the lung. So they're mm. constantly keeping this oxygenated flow. Pretty cool. It's good if you need to fly to keep oxygen in your blood basically constantly. So we've learned more recently that this also happens in some alligators and, and uh, lizards, but they do it uh, in a pretty different way. They don't really have air sacs. Anyway, so this was recognized in dinosaurs. Now it's worth pointing out that this has really only been pointed out to exist in, like I said before, sauropods and theropods, and it also appears in pterosaurs. Interestingly, ornithischian dinosaurs don't seem to have any evidence of this. So did they have air sacs? Were they breathing differently? There have been a few papers on this. Anyway, so today's paper is, is, a, is a nice look into an issue that uh, has been discussed quite a bit in, in this, uh, I wouldn't say debate, but this discussion about the origins of dinosaur breathing, or, and more so avian breathing. So while these big sauropods and theropods have these spaces carved in the vertebra for these air sacs, uh, for the diverticulae of the air sacs, I think I'll just say air sacs from this point forward because it's easier than saying diverticulae. So I am a hypocrite. But the very earliest sauropods, so before they get huge and quadrupedal when they're, when they're bipedal and smaller, and very early cerisians, so the group that includes sauropods and theropods, uh, things that were similar to theropods and possibly might be theropods, like Herrerasaurids, uh, they lack clear holes in their vertebra, these pleuroseals, uh, for, for the diverticular of the air sacs. This is interesting because this is also the pattern seen in pterosaurs, which appear to lack obvious air sac pleuroseals in the very early, very, very early members. So, the authors of this paper, they took, they, they got some vertebra from these very early sauropods, uh, Buriolestes um, and Pampadromius, as well as one very early Herrerasaur. They put it through a CT scanner and they checked out the internal architecture. So they noted that all these vertebrae have fossae, so depressions on the sides of their vertebra, and very small little holes uh, that we call foramina. These holes are not large enough to receive the lung and air sac tissue and are most likely uh, transmitting nerves or, or, or veins. So it seems that these animals did not have what we would consider pneumatic vertebra. And a pneumatic vertebra, again, is just when the air sac is invading your bone. Because you have a space in a vertebra doesn't necessarily mean it's pneumatic. Uh, that's often conflated in, in discussions of this anatomy. Anyway, so they put it through a CT scanner and they're like, all right, it doesn't look like there's pleuroseals, but they also notice that the inside of the vertebra in the centrum, which is kind of the spool shaped part, uh, and the neural arch is very chaotic. There are all these webs of bones that connect. Um, nothing that looks like a space that might be carved out by, a, by, by the diverticulate of the air sac. However, in the later of the two sauropodomor sauropodomorphs they have, uh, Pampadromius, they notice that there's slightly larger spaces. It's still very chaotic and, and not suggestive of any kind of pneumaticity. Anyway, so the authors conclude based on this evidence that the very earliest dinosaurs did not in fact have pneumatic vertebra. Uh, and this is prob at least the case for early cerisians, uh, early sauropods, the very oldest theropod, well, I don't wanna say the very oldest, one of the most early diverging theropods, Tawa, is pneumatic. It's fairly restricted, but it does have some pneumaticity in its skeleton. And like I said, this kind of depends on where Herrerasaurs go, if they're early theropods or if they're a little outside. And then pterosaurs. So they conclude that these early members of these clades were not pneumatic, and this suggests that this post crank so this pneumaticity in the, in the vertebra, and that would later extend in birds into the arms and the sternum, evolve separately at least three times, pterosaurs, sauropods, possibly theropods. So that's interesting, that, that's kind of wild. They propose an interesting kind of mechanism for, for this evolution, and this is something that's supported by developmental studies, but that is in which you begin to make the inside of your vertebra, it's still chaotic, but less, com it's more, 
it's still chaotic, but there's kind of an emerging complexity and order to those cavities inside the centra. And you can kind of see that in figure one. So maybe these cavities were full of fat or blood vessels, and it was along these existing cavities that started to begin to form in the vertebra that eventually these air sacs would invade. And that might just be as simple as you have an air sac and the easiest thing to invade is a large space that's already made in the skeleton. So as this evolves, uh, you see a few patterns in, in dinosaurs. There are camerate vertebra, and this is where you have a few large spaces, polycamerate vertebra in which you have numerous large spaces, uh, and then camelate vertebra, which is something you tend to see closer to birds. And this is where you have tons of tiny little pneumatic chambers. Made out of camels. Yes. No, I don't know why I agreed with that. You've, you've, I was in a, in, a, in a groove and you tricked me by saying something. You agreed because it's correct. Sure. Anyway, so interesting. Th this is kind of something that's been recognized in the literature for people who, who think about and talk about this stuff. Everyone's kind of like, yeah, it's weird that it doesn't look like it's in the really early things. But what this paper did uh, that was interesting and novel is that they, they, they looked at this in, in a scientific way. They looked at CT scans of these vertebra and they look beyond just the holes on the surface. They're like, wow, it's really like a pneumatic inside too. Now it is very important to point out that the absence of, pneumat of, of these pneumatic holes, these pleuroseals in the vertebra does not mean you don't have air sacs because sometimes air sacs don't invade the vertebra. So in some diving birds, grebes and loons, I think, uh, they have air sacs, but the air sacs don't, in, don't, they don't send what are in birds called paramedullary diverticulae, and that means that they're invading the vertebra and even contacting the, uh, the nerve cord. That's like, it's been proposed that that is kind of touching back to the, the sauropod stuff. It's been proposed that that's actually buffering the spinal column. Mm -hmm. uh, unclear why, because woodpeckers don't do it, and if anything needs to buffer the spinal column, it's probably a woodpecker, but whatever. But yeah, so some birds who do have air sacs don't have these diverticula, these these uh, these invasions of their vertebra. So it's possible early dinosaurs, early sauropods, early ther well, early pterosaurs, maybe early theropods, had com like a complex lung system, but it wasn't invading the skeleton yet, and that that happens separately within uh, within these disparate dinosaur clades. Now, I just want to see where are the figures. Honestly, that first figure, you, uh, there's some nice figures in the paper, mostly just showing the, showing the cross sections of the, of the vertebra. Um, I think it would be interesting to, uh, yeah, you can kind of see the proposed distribution in um, figure eight of kind of that, that evolution of that feature. I think it's also worth at least briefly discussing kind of what are the implications of this. So it's been proposed, right, at the, at the, at the end of the Triassic, we have two big archosaur faunas. We have predatory croc relatives, and we have, you know, there, there are early dinosaurs and little theropods, not particularly derived sauropods, etc. Probably ornithischians. <laughs> we'll have to find them. But why are dinosaurs taking over from crocs? At the end of the Triassic, there's a big extinction. A lot of stuff dies. All those cool, most of those cool ancient crocodile relatives eat it. Dinosaurs take over. So it's been proposed that the presence of a complex air sac system, uh, a, a complex respiratory ability in these early dinosaurs that might be related to endothermy, is what is what gave them the edge over crocs. I don't necessarily know if we can say that. It seems that right we're missing. These, at least these very early dinosaurs seem to lack it. It was established, at least in theropods in the Triassic. Um, but these early crocs are also pretty active based on the, based on the histology like Scott discussed earlier. Uh, they seem to have quick growth rates. Uh, we know living crocs can do unidirectional airflow through their uh, special regions in their lung. So I don't know if we can really say that, that the air sacs or the uh, or, or a more bird-like respiratory system is, is why dinosaurs end up 
filling in so quickly after Crocs. I think, I think honestly, an argument was made recently for feathery integument that, that is, a, I find a little more compelling in that regard. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, possible that early bird, early, uh, early dinosaurs were not as pneumatic, but still could have had air sacs. And that's something that the authors do discuss in their discussion and conclusions. They're no, by no means proposing that the entire air sac system evolved three times, just that the invasion of the air sac system into the skeleton did. Um, this is a quite, this is a system that desperately needs more work, even in living birds. The distribution of these air sacs, you know, what, what, do they have an adaptive role? Uh, I'm sorry, the diverticulate, do they have an adaptive role? Things like that are not well understood. A recent paper by uh, Weddell et al., and I think like a, a few days ago recent, um, was pretty cool because it was one of the first kind of bird-wide analyses of, of the distribution of of uh of this pneumaticity in the skeleton and there's some real weird patterns like some birds are completely anomatic like falcons apparently don't have any paramedullary diverticula uh pelicans so are diving birds but they do like they're incredibly pneumatic whereas grebes and loons are completely anomatic all sorts all sorts of very fascinating patterns so you know there's discussion to be had about like what of what what of these patterns is inherited from their ancestors could some of it be adaptive? Is it some of it size related? Smaller birds, like songbirds, tend to have slightly less pneumaticity. But like I said, there are kind of exceptions to each of these proposed uh, explanations that make it make it fairly complex. It's it's a topic I'm very very interested in and hoping to do more work on in the future. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts? I know I've been kind of talking a little while. No. Is uh, so I've got one thought. So you've discussed, I think, really well the fact that it's difficult to correlate the presence of air sacs at all in the fossil record. We know that these early members of all of these dinosaur and near dinosaur groups didn't have diverticulae of the air sacs invading the bones. Is there any skeletal cue we could use to try to determine whether air sacs are present? Or is that something we're never going to find out? Maybe. Um, probably not. Okay. So the issue is there are like, there are fossae in the vertebra that are similar to the ones we see in early dinosaurs. What's a fossa just for anybody? A depression in, in the, in the surface of the bone. Okay. Carnivorous mammal from Madagascar that eats lemurs. Ha ha ha. Um, but these, these, these depressions are also known in uh, stem synapsids and early diverging crocodile like pseudosuchians so we it, it you if you want to diagnose this this anatomy you really need a hole you need a you need a genuine pleurocele you need, you need a real opening uh and you need internal vertebral architecture because as this paper shows um if it's not invading the bone it's not making these camerate and polycamerate and camelate internal internal structures this is a this is a particularly confounding issue because ornithischians, none of them have any kind of pleuroceles. Um, even the earliest ones we have don't. But uh, Victor Rademacher uh, proposes, and I think fairly compellingly, that they're breathing differently than other dinosaurs. That they're using more of a diaphragm-like structure. But the earliest ones have gastralia, like Heterodontosaurus has gastralia, so maybe it was doing something more like the or dinosaur, the, the, the first dinosaur, the first avimetatarsalian, the common, the group that includes pterosaurs too. What's so, the role, what's the role of a gastralia in breathing? Oh, so yeah, your gastralia yeah, are your, are your, are these belly ribs and not a lot of living reptiles have these. So tuatara have them and gators have them. Mm -hmm. um, Just so gators the, or all crocodilians? I, I, I'm crocodilians. Okay, okay. I was I was Sorry. thought that this might have just been an alligatoroid feature. I was like, wait, what? But yeah, so no living birds have them. But Archaeopteryx does, uh, and kind of all your dinosaurs have them. But well, no, that's not true. A lot of dinosaurs have them. But essentially, it's been proposed that the ribs, gastralia, and sternum are all helping to ventilate the lung in dinosaurs, at least in archosaurs generally and then in dinosaurs you have like two paths in ornithischians you are trading off that kind of rib 
and gastralia ventilation for a muscle that is inserting onto the lungs from the pubis that is pulling your viscera back like a diaphragm. And ornithischians, later ornithischians, have this big process at the at the tip of their at this hip bone uh, that seems to could serve for an attachment point like that. Hmm. Sauropods and theropods seem to be rib and gastralia driven, but also have air sacs. And in theropods, as we get closer to birds, the sternum, that bony element at the front of the body gets bigger and bigger and more jointed uh, and more bird-like. Because in birds, uh, living birds at least, they drop those, they get rid of the gastralia and they just have this huge sternum. So their ribs and sternum are doing all the lung pumping action. And then the air sacs are there to move air more efficiently through the body. So long answer and short answer are the same answer, which is you really, it, without the without the frame and you're kind of. Uh... Alex, I have a question. Yes, Papa. Do you think that if I had gastralia, it would have hurt less when I walked belly first into that pole earlier today? No, you hit it at such speed that I think you would have shattered your belly ribs and they would <laughs> impale your organs. Okay, so it's good that I don't have them. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know the whole thing that they were involved in breathing. I always ever heard that they were, like, serve some sort of protective function. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's Shack Shackner. It might be Emma Shackner. I can't remember. Or if it's Brocklehurst or Shackner. It could be both of them. But they did this kind of big, big review paper on archosauromorphs. And they have this, um, they, they reconstruct the ancestral archosauromorph breathing anatomy as what they call costosternal, so costal ribs, sternum. Uh, and they, they hypothesize that the gastralia uh, are involved in this, in that they, they, are, they seem to help deform the body cavity for breathing in crocs. Um, and interestingly enough, they're probably being moved by muscles attached to the pubis, because that's mm. what's doing it in, pardon me, in crocodilians and like the sternum in birds is still being moved by a similar muscle system. So this is all probably like, you know, not directly homologous, but there is probably a, a deep homology in there. So like something that's maybe developmental or, or some such thing. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a neat little subfield. It's what a lot of my dissertation was gonna be for the pandemic, but Maybe my postdoc will be back. I'll have to ask Rob about that when I see him at the holiday party tomorrow. Oh, cool. Well, tell yeah. him I like his stuff. I will. You hear, you hear that, Rob? Alex likes your stuff. I know you watch these videos. <laughs> All right. Um, that's dinosaur pneumaticity. It's really interesting, and we're getting better at knowing about it. Okay, and I think with that, that's the end of this episode of the Fossil Friday Review. Newly renamed, because we thought of a better title three episodes in. Make sure you like and comment and subscribe on the video, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.